North Carolina's Research Triangle Park, working mainly with hardware. And this was back when you could make a living as a hardware instructor or hardware technician. That's where I got my start. So setting dip switches and jumper settings, building uh, PCs from scratch. And I moved into networking a, um, and started working with uh, Novell 3.1. Stayed with Novell for a little while, but once Windows 2000 came out with Microsoft, I sort of sold my soul to, to Microsoft because I, I could tell immediately that if you could secure a Microsoft system, you were probably going to have a job. And that's certainly been true uh, throughout my duration in this field. I've continued to work in the field. I moved up to the DC area. I've worked uh, to come up here to work with the Foreign Service Institute. And so I've worked with both public and private sector, have some good exposure to both realms. I enjoy working in the, in, uh, in the commercial industry a little bit more than I do working in the government arena. So that's where I am now. And as Brent mentioned, I own my own company uh, called Cybertrain IT, and I work very closely with UMBC um, in order to develop and uh, enhance the cybersecurity training. I've got certifications across the field. This um, course that I'll be doing today is a little excerpt from Security Plus and uh, CISSP as well, because both of those courses require an understanding of cryptography. And the way I try to teach cryptography in my courses is that you have no exposure to cryptography. So if you do, we're going to start off very basic and build up. And if you don't, um, you know, we all want to make sure that we start from a level playing field. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing we want to talk about are just the basics of cryptography. And in this course, we're not going to get into anything deep. You know, you don't have to have a doctorate of cryptography to, to follow this. We're going to keep it uh, nice and appropriate for the level, like I said, of introduction to cryptography. So when we start out, the first thing we want to talk about are the security services that cryptography provides us. You know, if, if you think about with crypto, most people, if you say, hey, why am I going to use cryptography? Almost everybody that you talk to is immediately going to say for privacy, right? We think about cryptography, we're going to keep our secrets secret, we're going to keep them private. And that's what everybody thinks of for crypto. And that's absolutely correct. That's absolutely a fine answer. However, you also are able to get authenticity with cryptography. And when we talk about authenticity, what we want to be able to do is verify the origin of a message or verify a claimed identity. So when you send me an email message or when I receive an email message that purports to be, for instance, from Clara, I want to be able to have some means of cryptographic proof that that message really is from Clara and not from someone else. So that's authenticity. We want to be able to verify the origin of a message. Now, with integrity, we want to be able to detect modification or corruption. I want to know that nothing's been modified. So with audit logs, for instance, I want to be able to know that I can trust my audit logs, that nobody's gone in and modified or manipulated them. I want to make sure that the email that I send you is the same as the email that you receive. That comes back to integrity. And then when we go to non-repudiation, non-repudiation is actually a combination of authenticity and integrity. With non-repudiation, a sender can't dispute having sent a message nor the contents of the message. So I can't say, oh, that message wasn't from me. It must have been spoofed. No, we have authenticity. And I can't say, okay, well, it was from me, but somebody's modified it in transit. No, because we have non-repudiation. So ultimately, what we want to make sure of is that I have all the security services I need. So when we think about these security services, we think about privacy, we think about authenticity, we think about integrity and non-repudiation. And if you're like I am, I like little mnemonic tricks to help me remember things. So if you're ever wondering about the security services provided by cryptography, you can just think of the pain of cryptography. All right, so when we think about that again, privacy, we're gonna prevent unauthorized disclosure, keep our secret secret. Authenticity, we wanna be able to verify an identity. Integrity, we wanna be able to guarantee nothing's been modified. And then non-repudiation, we want that combination of integrity and authenticity together. These are distinctly different security services. At least the first three are, right? We said non-repudiation kind of includes multiple ones, but uh, authenticity and integrity. The point I want to make there, though, is that 
you can't sell cryptography short and just think of it for privacy. It does lots of other services for us, and we're going to see that in a few minutes. All right, now, um, as we move on, next thing we want to look at is we want to look at some of the basic definitions and concepts with crypto. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, when we talk about crypto, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take plain text and turn it into cipher text, so to speak, right? We've got a plain text message and we want to obfuscate its meaning so that someone from the outside can't detect it. So usually when we're looking at providing encryption, we're trying to take plain text and turn it into cipher text. And to do so, we need three things. We need an initialization vector, and that initialization vector I'll frequently refer to as an IV, initialization vector. We'll need an algorithm, and another name for an algorithm is a cipher. Okay, and then we need a key as well. So we got a lot of things that we need. We need an initialization vector, an algorithm, and a key. And I wanna show you how this works together. Um, let's start out by talking about an initialization vector. And let's talk about what this does. So an IV or an initialization vector, its job is to provide randomness. Randomness is really important with cryptography. We want to make sure that the plain text is as far removed from the cipher text as possible. So we want to make sure that we add plenty of randomness. Okay, so let's, let's think about this. For those of you that have an MP3 player uh, or some form of digital music player, and I'm guessing most of you do. If you're like I am, you have a lot of songs. You know, I've, I've had the same uh, digital music list I've had for years and years and years, and I've got somewhere around 700, 800 songs. And what's interesting to me is every time I play my music, I put it on random, right? Because if you don't put it on random, you hear the same one, two, three, one, two, three songs over and over and over. So, I don't want to have that happen, so I put it on random. However, every time I play my music, I still find that that same annoying song, I don't even know how it got on my MP3 player in the first place, seems to play. And I don't know if any of you guys have that same thing, but, and I'm not kidding you about this, I loaned, so this goes back to the day when I had um, an iPod, and I loaned that to a friend of mine who was driving to Canada. And she downloaded the soundtrack to the Broadway musical Annie on my iPod. I kid you not. So I know I can remove it there. And this has been 15 years ago. But I just never think to do that until, you know, I pull up at a stoplight. I'm feeling kind of hip. I got the Black Eyed Pe Peas playing. I'm feeling, you know, I'm 40. So I'm, I mean, I'm 50. So how hip can you be? But I'm kind of feeling it. And then all of a sudden, the sun will come out tomorrow just comes blaring through my speakers. So the question is, if I have this player on random, why do I not feel like I'm getting good randomness, right? Well, let's look at something. Um, what I'm going to do, and you guys use your chat feature for me, uh, the chat window, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask some of you to provide me with a number. I just want a number between 1 and 10. I don't want any, don't give me pi or fractions, just, just a solid basic number between 1 and 10. You can tell I've probably done this before. Okay, so Dave is going to give me 8. Okay. And I'm going to take 8 plus, I see we have 7 plus 6. Whoops. Okay, so for those of you that gave me numbers, whoops, minus three plus three, oops, plus five. Okay, for those of you that gave me numbers, and I chose some of the numbers given, if I did not choose your number, please do not be offended. I will come back to you uh, later. So 
we took these numbers. You guys just gave me totally random numbers. And I use random math. I didn't know if I was going to add or subtract or add or subtract until I wrote the numbers down. It was just totally off the top of my head. But the point I want to make is this. If I always start at the zero track and then I add eight, I go to the eighth track. Then I add seven. I'm at the 15th track. Plus six. I'm at the 21st track plus four, 25th track, minus three, 22nd track, and so on and so forth. If I always start at zero, even though you guys gave me random numbers and I used random math, we don't really get randomness, right? If I start at zero every single time, the first song will always jump to the eighth track. Then the second will advance seven to the 15th track if you see what I'm saying. So even though we've got random math and even though we've got random numbers, random values, we don't really truly get randomness. But what if, let's say, um, Kent, give me a number between one and a hundred. Not trying to catch anybody off guard here. So if I, uh, 55, perfect. That is an excellent number, Kent. Thank you. Okay, now I see uh, the next number given me. Now we go to 37. All right, Mimi, give me a number between one and 100. 28. You see how if I rotate that starting point to different numbers, if I randomize the starting point, now we get better randomness. And that's the purpose of an initialization vector. We're going to randomize where we start, and that adds more randomness to the process. Now, I said give me a number between 1 and 100 for this initial point, this starting point. We're still going to get repetition. But what if I said between 1 and 1,000, or 1 and 10,000, or 1 in 10 million? The larger the initialization vector, the more randomness we get at the beginning, and the more randomness we add to the process. Okay. So what we want is a nice long initialization vector. Well, how long? The answer is long enough. And that's the answer with a lot of security questions. How much security do you need? You need enough. And, you know, sometimes we'll hear that idea of you can never have too much security. You absolutely can have too much security. And when you have so much security that the overhead or you have issues with employee access, people can't do, you know, if you've got a system that's so locked down, nobody can do the work they want to do, that's too much security. So you want a good long initialization vector, but you don't want, want one that's so long that it takes up all the processing capabilities of your system, right? And information can't get communicated. So the answer of how long, long enough. Um, many uh, initialization vectors that we use today might be 48 bits, might be 56 bits. You know, we're still going to use other factors to make this secure, but on top of things, we want to add an initialization vector. Okay. All right. Now, initialization vectors are for cryptography when we're talking about privacy of messages. However, we also use cryptography to secure passwords, right? We have to encrypt our passwords. When we talk about cryptography with passwords, we refer to that as hashing passwords. And we don't use initialization vectors with hashes. We use seeds or salts. If you've ever heard about seeding, the idea of seeding a password or salting a password, but it's the exact same idea. We're going to add randomness to the process to make it more random. So when you hear some of these breaches where passwords get compromised, many times it's because the passwords were not seeded. So they didn't take that extra step to add that extra randomness. Do I have to use initialization vectors when I encrypt data? No, but it makes things more secure. Okay, I'm going to just stop there and see if anybody's got a question. And I'm going to trust that if you do have questions along the way, just jump into the chat room and type it out. You know, treat this just like a class, because like I said, I'm really here to convey some information that I think is very helpful uh, and very interesting. So if you have any questions, please feel free to jump right in with them, okay? All right, so what's our initialization vector? It's a point of origin that we want to randomize so that we get more randomness in the process, okay? Now, Okay, let's go back to our little formula here. All right, now we start off with plain text. We use an initialization vector. 
The next thing we have to think about is the algorithm, okay? So plain text plus an initialization vector plus an algorithm plus a key is what comes together to give me ciphertext. So we've talked about the initialization vector. Let's look at the algorithm next, okay? So another word from an algorithm is cipher. There's never any reason I'll use cipher other than algorithm, other than just to mix things up a little bit. All right, so um, I don't know if I mentioned this to you all in my introduction, but I am from North Carolina originally. And I know you guys pegged me for someone from Brooklyn. I know this is, uh, I've really got the well-disguised Southern accent here. Um, but yeah, I grew up in North Carolina, which means I am the proud product of the North Carolina public school system. Woo! 47th, 47th in the nation. State motto is, at least we're not Alabama. That's all I've got to say about that. For those of you from Alabama in our group, I send my apologies. But at any rate, 12 years in the North Carolina public school system, if what you see on the screen, that is all the math I learned to do, okay? I can take any number and add two to it. I can take any number and subtract by two. I can take any number and multiply by two, divide by two. I can raise it to the power of two. I can take the square root of, but that's it. I don't know any other math. This is all the math that I've learned. That's Kelly's algorithm, okay? So Kelly's algorithm is the collection of math functions that can be performed. Now, when we think about an algorithm, there are a couple of characteristics that are desirable for the algorithm. First of all, we want an algorithm that has what's called confusion. And when we talk about confusion, we want good, strong math. Okay. If you look at the math functions here that I've used in Kelly's algorithm, that's not good, strong math, right? That's North Carolina math. There's nothing over the top sophisticated about this. When we talk about cryptographic algorithms, we want good, strong, sophisticated math, lots of variables. Um, we want it to be a very, um, a very intensive process to remove the original text from the cipher text. So we want better math than this. You know, a lot of times people make the mistake of thinking, oh, all algorithms are equal, it's just which one has a longer key, okay? That's not true at all. The heart and soul of an algorithm is the math. And when we refer to an algorithm that has good, strong math, we say it has a high degree of confusion. That's what we want. So this sad little math that has no confusion with it. Now, there is something called Kirchhoff's principle. And Kirchhoff is spelled really close to how I have it here on this slide. I think I'm missing a K somewhere, but uh, you know, it's, it's close to that. But what Kirchhoff's principle says is, let algorithms be known. So this is something I'm using for cryptography. Why in the world would I let the whole community look at my algorithm? Why in the world would I let everybody know what math I'm using? Well, let me ask you a question. How many of you there Ah, Dom, thank you. I knew there was a K I'd forgotten. I just couldn't remember when I was looking over there. I was like, oh, I left the K out. I just couldn't decide where I was going to put the K. So I just, I, I didn't, I didn't get too fancy with it. Thank you for that correct spelling. Um, so if I were to say, you know, don't open this up to everybody. The idea is if I do open this up to everybody, then the entire cryptographic community can take a look at the math functions I'm using and they can provide suggestions on how to make it better. They can break it and put it back again. So the idea about making algorithms open is so that you can get the support of the cryptographic community. And there really has always been an argument between the closed community and the open community. You know, if you look at um, operating systems like Unix and Linux that have open code, you know, versus Microsoft, for instance, that has closed source code. You know, the idea behind not making your information, your code available, is the idea is if you can't see it, you can't break it. But how's that working? That's not really working so well. That's not how it really pans out. So Kirchhoff says, make your algorithms known. 
So you want to use publicly known algorithms, you know, an obscure secret algorithm. Sometimes folks think, oh, this must be better because it's not part of the public domain. Not really, because it's not as tried and true. It's not as trusted. All right, so when we're choosing algorithms for what we do, we want good publicly known algorithms that have a lot of confusion. Now, the algorithms are the math functions. So what would happen in this scenario that I have is, remember, everything we do on the computer comes down to numbers, right? Ones and zeros. And data in, in these sorts of uh, mathematical algorithms, data gets chunked into what we call blocks. Okay, so maybe here's an entire stream of data. We're gonna chunk 64 blocks of that data. And that block of data goes through a series of these math functions that are part of my algorithm. How many math functions and in what order, that's dictated by the key. So the key provides the instructions on which math functions of the algorithm are called, if that makes sense, okay? So what this ultimately comes down to is we start with our plain text. We use an initialization vector to add some randomness to the beginning of the process because randomness is good. Then we need an algorithm and that algorithm is the collection of math functions. Um, and then the key provides instructions on which math functions in which order. Kirchhoff says, make sure you use well-known publicly open algorithms and that have good confusion. The key, if the algorithm is going to be open, then we better make sure that we protect the key, right? We have to keep the key secret. All right, so that's just kind of a little overview. I, I, I find sometimes that uh, when we teach ourselves some of this information along the way, sometimes um, we just take, it's just taken for granted that we use all these terms the same. And I just want to make sure that we have an understanding of algorithm, key, initialization vector, and so on. Okay, so those are some of our terms. I'm going to pause again just to see if anybody's got some questions or any ideas or thoughts. You guys are all wrapped to your monitor, aren't you? What's next? What's next? Okay, so now that we have those basic ideas and we know that we need an algorithm to provide the encryption because that algorithm is really going to bring the math of how to translate from plain text to ciphertext, the next thing we want to talk about is the fact that there are several different types of algorithms. And the first type of algorithm that we'll look at is symmetric algorithms. And there are um, lots of symmetric algorithms. Symmetric cryptography is very frequently used. I do want to mention symmetric cryptography can also be called private key cryptography. It can also be called secret key cryptography. It can also be called shared key cryptography. Sometimes I think the hardest thing about symmetric cryptography is just remembering all the names it can go by. So when people say private key cryptography, they're talking about symmetric or secret key or shared key. All right, so when we look at symmetric cryptography, this is pretty straightforward and I think most people find this pretty easy to understand because we can relate to it. The idea is that both parties have to have the same key. You can see here on the screen, we have Alice wanting to send a message to Bob. Well, Alice uses a symmetric key to encrypt that same key must be used by Bob to decrypt. So the hardest thing about that is the key exchange, okay? There's one key shared between two parties. How does Alice get Bob the key? Can she send it across the network to him? Well, no, we've got to keep that key secret and network traffic is not encrypted by default, right? I can't email it, email's not encrypted by default. Um, I could write it down on a little yellow sticky note and stick it on his monitor. That's always good. Or if you're like me and you remember the days when we were really secure, we didn't stick the sticky note on the monitor. We put it underneath the keyboard of the computer. So step for security there. Um, the problem is, how do I get you the key? It's just like if I want to um, go out of town and I have three dogs. I have three delightful dogs. Uh, Boston Terriers, all three of them, and I need a dog sitter. Is anybody, anybody here uh, a dog person? Do I have any dog people? 
I know I've got somebody who's a dog person. All right, John, I saw you first. Do you mind pet sitting for me? Three lovely Boston Terriers. And I'm going to ask John to come over and watch them. I got to get John the key. Now, I can put it under the mat. That's not security. As a matter of fact, that's something called security through obscurity. And that goes along with the idea we were talking about closed source code just a few minutes ago. The idea that if you can't see it, then you can't get to it. You can't break it. So putting a key under my mat doesn't do any good. My favorite is uh, putting it in an envelope in the mailbox because nobody would ever think to check on your mailbox. I could, you know, the best way would be for me to walk over and put it in John's hand, but the problem is that's not convenient. So what I want you to think about here with symmetric cryptography, the greatest problem that we deal with is the fact that we got to share this key between parties. And our encryption is only as secure as our key distribution. So if I ask John to watch the dogs and I tape the key to the front door, there's no telling how many people will come and go from my house. Just like what we talked about with our algorithms, if our algorithms are open, our keys have to be uh, protected. So what we've got to do is we've got to figure out a way to deal with this, okay? Now, when it comes down to it, what we're looking at here, um, or, or the greatest problem that you'll hear with symmetric cryptography is something called out of band key exchange. Out of band key exchange. And what that means is there's nothing that's part of a symmetric algorithm that makes it easy to exchange the key. You and I have to exchange the key ahead of time. Now with our symmetric algorithms, if we have exchanged the key ahead of time and you and I both have a good, strong, secret key that we share, we can get good privacy, okay? But we gotta figure out how to get that key from one party to the next, okay? So that's one problem, this idea of out-of-band key exchange. The other problem with this, with symmetric cryptography, is it's not scalable. And when I say it's not scalable, what we're talking about is we can't use symmetric cryptography in a, long, a large environment. Okay, so let's say every one of us here um, within this classroom, let's see how many folks we have, we've got 26 people. We've all decided to join a dog watching club and all of us are in this meeting. So we're all gonna generate our own house key and we're gonna share our house key with everybody in this class. So I've gotta have a house key for every one of you and you have to have a house key for everyone. You see how many keys that would be within a very simple environment? 26 people really isn't that large an environment, but we would have to have keys for every single party here. That's a lot of keys. So with symmetric cryptography, the fact that you have to share a key with every single party you're communicating with, that doesn't grow very well. Okay. And then the last issue is that we only get privacy from symmetric cryptography. We don't get integrity or authenticity, which means no non-repudiation. All right, so for example, um, if I'm going through and I am um, let's say that I share a key with Greg, okay? And he and I use that secret key in order to encrypt communications between us, okay? We both have a key. So the fact that data is encrypted with a key that Greg and I share, that means you can't get cryptographic proof of the origin of the message. So for instance, think of it this way. Let's say that there's a, a locker in the back of, the class, of a classroom. Both Greg and I have a key to that locker. Over the weekend, somebody leaves a tuna fish sandwich in there. Now you guys have known me less than an hour and you already know it was probably me who left the tuna fish sandwich in the locker. But I'm gonna blame Greg and I can get away with that because he has a key also. So you don't get authenticity with a symmetric key because two parties share that key, if that makes sense. You can get privacy, but you don't get authenticity. 
The second thing you don't get is you don't get integrity. I'm going to encrypt the file with the key that Greg and I share, send him that message. There's nothing about that file being encrypted that guarantees it hasn't been modified, right? So someone could have modified that file or that file could have been corrupted across the wire at any point in time. It being encrypted with the key that Greg and I shared, that doesn't, that doesn't prevent it. That doesn't change it. Okay. So we've got symmetric cryptography. You know, it, it's pretty straightforward and easy to understand, but you've got a big problem distributing keys to all your parties, uh, the parties for communication. It doesn't grow well. You only get privacy. You don't get integrity or authenticity. These are some real problems. So then the question, you know, would be, well, why in the world am I even considering using symmetric cryptography uh, when it has these drawbacks? And the reason for that is it is fast, 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 and fast. We want to use symmetric cryptography because it's fast. Because of the complexity of asymmetric algorithms and because of how symmetric algorithms work, I can use a much shorter key for symmetric cryptography than I would have to use for asymmetric, which means symmetric cryptography is thousands of times faster than asymmetric. It's all about speed, okay? Um, so what I want you to keep in the back of your mind for now is symmetric cryptography is what we want to get to. We want to come back and we want to do bulk data exchange with symmetric cryptography. That's what we want. Okay, um, why? Because we like speed. But we got to solve some of these problems about not having a way to exchange keys. We got to figure out a way to exist in a large environment. We've got to figure out how to get integrity and authenticity. Okay, so we'll look at asymmetric cryptography, which provides that in just a second. Okay, now before I leave talking about symmetric cryptography, I just wanted to mention there are two types of symmetric cryptography, two types of symmetric algorithms or ciphers. And the first is called a stream cipher, the second is called a block cipher. And by the way, if you're wondering when do, when do I choose this, when do I see this, the answer is you really don't. This gets chosen by an application developer when they're designing a program. So for instance, if someone's designing um, an application for email, for instance, then they're gonna choose um, symmetric cryptography to encrypt the message itself and its contents because symmetric cryptography is fast, okay? That's gonna be built into the application. It's, it's not like you're gonna right click on a file and say, oh, I'm gonna transmit this with asymmetric, I'll transmit that one with symmetric. This is really kind of under the surface in where the application gets developed, okay? But it's still good to see you know, and kind of understand what's happening along the way. Because even though this is chosen a lot of times at the developer's level, it still has impact on the security services you and I need, of course. All right. So now we've got symmetric algorithms. And within a symmetric algorithm, there uh, these algorithms can function as either streams or blocks. Okay. So the stream ciphers frequently use a process called XOR. And this is just a high level. Let me just show you the math real quick of this. Okay. So the idea is in the exclusive OR, which is what that stands for, the XOR process, what you get is you get bit by bit examination. And as a matter of fact, that's a characteristic of stream ciphers that you'll often hear, is you'll often hear the idea of one bit at a time. So what that means is you can kind of draw a line and you can see that what's happening is each bit is getting compared, each bit of the plain text is getting compared with the bit of the cipher. So the way this works actually, just make sure this is clear in what we see here. <laughs> okay, that's actually plain text up here at the top. And then we're going to X or with the key, OK? 
okay? You could sometimes hear this as a key string uh, or a key stream. Hang on, let me just fill this real quick. Okay, so I take the plain text and the key and I match them together. Where the values are alike, the ciphertext becomes zero. Where the values are different, the ciphertext becomes one. So what happens with these stream ciphers is first bit of your plain text, in this case, is one. First bit of the key, that's zero. Those two are different. So the ciphertext that replaces is one. The next two, one and zero are different. Zero and one are different. One and O are different. Zero and one are different. Up. Oh, but right here, we have uh, zero and zero. Those values are the same. So the ciphertext becomes zero. One and one, that ciphertext is the same. So, uh, or those bits are the same. So the ciphertext becomes zero. So the XOR process is actually very easy. Um, it's very quick. It's very straightforward. It's very easy to do one way. It's also very easy to reverse. So if you knew the key, you could immediately decrypt the text. Okay, so that's kind of a security issue, right? Anything that's easy to encrypt or fast to encrypt is going to be faster to decrypt. So what we have with symmetric uh, uh, algorithms, we have the fact that they're fast but insecure. Now, I'll make a lot of generalizations. That's not to say that every single symmetric uh, stream cipher on the planet is weak and very fast and all those things. But we talk in generalizations, especially in some of our, um, you know, our uh, introductory classes. So we're going to say stream ciphers are fast but insecure. We like speed, okay? But we need to work on that weakness. There is one stream cipher that you'd want to know and be familiar with because that stream cipher is called RC4. RC4. And RC4 is the algorithm uh, for those of you that work with wireless. Uh, this is the algorithm that WPA and WEP use. Sorry, I had a little typo there. Um, and that's part of the vulnerability of WEP and WPA for wireless security is that they use RC4 as the algorithm. It's a weak algorithm because it's a stream cipher. Okay. All right. So the only modern algorithm we really talk about today that's a stream, you know, for the most part, is RC4. And the only reason we talk about them, uh, we talk about that is because it was used for WEP and WPA. We're not on WPA or WEP anymore. We're on WPA2 and WPA3 is on, you know, is on the horizon. So RC4 is really kind of getting pushed out as, as it really should be. It's poorly implemented in, in WEP and WPA. Okay, but that's my stream cipher. It has to do with how the math works. Symmetric ciphers or algorithms are either streams or their blocks, which is actually what I talked about earlier. Remember when I talked about the fact that I had um, only so many math functions that I knew how to do my North Carolina math? So the idea behind that was that if we go back and we look at this, let me just come back here. You know, we talked about each of these math functions that are being used. Well, each one of these is uh, referred to in a block cipher as an S box, not an X box, an S box, a substitution box. So what happens is data gets chunked into blocks and each block of data goes through a specific S box to have some math performed. After the math is performed, the characters come out are different. That same block of data goes somewhere else to get further encrypted and further encrypted and further encrypted and so on. Okay, so that's the way block ciphers work. Because block ciphers use much more sophisticated math, then um, they're more complex, which is good in the realm of privacy. However, if we're looking at performance, that's not as desirable. So what we'll remember about our block ciphers is that they're slow, but more secure. So if all we care about speed, we might go with uh, our stream ciphers. But if we're going to encrypt, we're usually primarily thinking of privacy. So what we generally use are our block ciphers. Now, um, there are lots of different block ciphers. 
if we take a look at these, the most common by far is AES. And AES stands for Advanced Encryption Standard. Okay, so Advanced Encryption Standard. This is what the government is using and has been using for quite a while to protect its sensitive but unclassified information. And when you look at this advanced encryption standard, this is really the de facto standard for encryption today. So if you're gonna encrypt a file in email, chances are good the algorithm working underneath the surface is AES. If you're gonna send something encrypted uh, using HTTPS or you know, any other secure mechanism, it's probably using AES. That's by far just the most common uh, of the symmetric ciphers. Okay, it's a good, it's, it's, it's one you can just kind of think of as the de facto standard, okay. Uh, there are others, you may have heard of DES, which is, uh, you know, what we used for the government 30, 35 years ago. That makes me feel so old. Um, two fish and blowfish. Blowfish is actually um, uh, a little less secure than AES because of the way that it math work, its math works, but it was, it was used for a long time. And then there are other you know, symmetric algorithms, really the one that you're going to see almost assuredly is AES. Okay. All right. So a quick review, pros and cons of symmetric cryptography, the downsides. We got to figure out a way to share that key because I will encrypt with the key. You need that same key to decrypt the message. So I got to figure out how I'm going to get it to you. And remember, we call that out of band key exchange. And all that means is I don't know how I'm going to get you the key, but I have to get you the key before we can communicate. All right. Now, the second uh, problem, it's not scalable. It doesn't grow well for a large environment. And then the third problem is, remember, it only gives me privacy. It doesn't give me that integrity, authenticity, non-repudiation. So those are big problems, but we look to use it because it's fast. So the primary thing, we want to use symmetric cryptography for bulk data exchange. Meaning, if we have this message contents, if we have, you know, the payload of what we're exchanging, we would prefer for that to be exchanged using symmetric cryptography because it's fast. But we got to solve some of those other problems. All right. So your cliffhanger, how in the world are we going to solve these problems with symmetric cryptography? Tune in next week. No, no, no. Tune in to the next slide. See, you're binge watching cryptography now, so you don't have to tune in for next week's, next week's show. All right, so we're going to solve some of the problems with symmetric cryptography with asymmetric cryptography, but it's going to have its own problems too, okay? So let's talk about asymmetric cryptography, and even from the name, you know, symmetric means same. Same key is used to encrypt and decrypt, but now we have asymmetric, so we're thinking different not the same. So what's going to happen is in an asymmetric environment is every user gets a key pair. Okay. You get a public key and you get a private key. All right. Right off the bat, that solves the problem with scalability because you only have two keys you have to keep up with, right? Your public and your private key. And of course, your private is the most important because your public key can be shared with the public. But your private key is bound to your identity. It is what provides authentic, uh, authentication for you. It is, um, it, it should be that one thing that is beyond reproach that you have and only you have. If at any point in time your private key were to be compromised, then you would have to have both keys revoked and you would have to get a new key pair. That private key must be kept secret and must be protected. Okay. Now, the magic of asymmetric cryptography, when we talk about this, the magic is in the relationship of the keys. Okay. The private key gets created first, and then the public key is a mathematical derivative of the private key. So what that means, or what that relationship requires, is that anything encrypted with one key can only be decrypted by the other. Okay. So if you were to encrypt something with Kelly Handerhan's public key, 
The only thing that could decrypt it is Kelly Handerhan's private key, right? Anything encrypted with my public can only be decrypted with my private. Well, because of having a public and a private key, that solves the problem of secure key distribution, out-of-band key exchange. You don't have to do that because I will happily give you my public key. And if you have something sensitive that you need to send to me, if you'll encrypt that sensitive material with Kelly's public key, the only thing that will be able to decrypt it is Kelly's private key. And who is the only person on the planet that should have Kelly's private key? That would be Kelly. So you don't have to worry about sending me a key that we share and we have to keep secret and we have to keep protected. My public key is readily available. As a matter of fact, often they're published in a key server, a key management server. Okay, and anybody can have access to those. And even more frequently, frequently than that, our administrators incorporate our keys with applications. So for instance, you know, nobody's ever asked me, nobody's ever called me and say, hey, Kelly, can you send me your public key? And I'm sure nobody's ever called you to do the same thing, right? So what really happens when you ask to get my public key? Your application asks my application. You know, if you connect to a web server and you think about HTTPS, what does that S on the end of HTTPS stand for? Anyone? See, you didn't know there was going to be class participation, but you got to got to stay awake. Got to put the coffee down. Yep, stands for secure, right? Nothing fancy there. Stands for security. All right. But what happens is when I type out and I use the HTTPS protocol to my web server, that S says, listen, buddy, we're going to have a secure connection. You need to give me your public key. So it's my web browser asking the web server by the use of the protocol that we've chosen. Absolutely right, Elliot. It's not SSH, it's SSL. And it's now today TLS, but you're on the right track. Absolutely. <laughs> I love hypertext transfer protocol sandwich. I like that. I could go with that. All right. But does that make sense? So you'll never really ask. A lot of times I'll say, okay, so you ask me for my public key. What I really mean is your application asks my application. Your web browser connects to me. When you connect saying HTTPS, I say, oh, you want my public key. Here's my public key. I don't have to worry about sending my public key across the internet, across an unsecured network, across anywhere, because there's nothing sensitive on the public key. But the magic of that is when you use my public key to encrypt files for me, the only thing that can decrypt it is my private key, which only I should have. So we still get secure data exchange, but I don't have to have a pre-share, I don't have to share anything across the wire. That's a big benefit. That's a huge benefit because really when it comes to symmetric cryptography, the big problem is key exchange. Asymmetric right off the bat just doesn't worry about the problem of key exchange because of the relationship between the public and private key pair. Okay, so it's scalable. We don't have to worry about the key exchange. Next piece we're going to see is how we get authenticity, integrity, and non-repudiation. Okay, with asymmetric cryptography. All right, so I've actually already done this first slide because we already know how to get privacy in an asymmetric environment. The sender encrypts the message with the receiver's public key. So the way this looks is when I am, um, when I connect to uh, the network and I decide maybe I'm going to send Jordan an email message. Okay. And I pour, pull Jordan's name out of the global address list. Well, the network administrator has incorporated Jordan's email in that global address list. So when I pull the name out and then I click on the option to encrypt, then Outlook uses that key, Jordan's public key to encrypt the message. So it's seamless to the users, which is exactly how we want things to be to the users. We don't want users to worry about, oh my gosh, I lost my key. Where do I get my key? How do I type in this key? What's the format? We don't want users talking about keys. We want it to look like magic. We want our users to think elves and gnomes are involved. We want them to just go, wow, it's amazing the magic that makes this work. 
right? The only time people start talking about keys and exchanges is when things aren't working and that's not a good sign. Okay, so we want it to be automagic. So what happens? I pull your name out of the global address list. All I have to do as an end user is to click encrypt. But because the admin has included everybody's public keys and integrated that with your exchange server, your mail server, now I can encrypt by using the receiver's public key. I send you the message. Jordan decrypts the message with Jordan's private key which is the only thing that'll work. And now we've gotten secure data exchange, okay? So it's in the application. All of this, you're never gonna see, you know, again, except when things aren't working properly. But privacy, privacy through asymmetric cryptography, we always do that by using the receiver's public key, okay? That's the easy one. Now the next one, we'll talk about authenticity. Now, authenticity um, can be a little bit tricky. And the reason for this is everybody tries to make cryptography about secrecy, privacy. Ooh, I don't want people to see what this message is. But if you'll remember when we talked about the pain of cryptography, privacy, authenticity, integrity, non-repudiation, when we talked about that, there are other services that we can get with crypto. Not everything is about privacy. It may just be that I want you to know the message came from me, that it isn't a spoofed or an impersonated message. I'm not trying to keep the content secret for now, okay? All I want to do is let you know the message came from me, okay? Well, in that case, what I might do, and this is might, there are other ways to make this work. Let's say I have this message for you. And the message is in plain text. I'm not gonna encrypt the message because I don't need all that overhead. All I want is for when you to get this message, I want you to know it really did come from Kelly. So what if my application attaches something like a timestamp to the message? Now, the reason I say a timestamp, and it doesn't have to be that, it could be any one of lots of different things, but a timestamp isn't something that's sensitive. So for instance, I don't care who knows that it's 12 o'clock right? I'm not trying to protect that. I'm not trying to keep that secret. Well, why even put it on the message? Because when I put that timestamp on the message, what I, as the sender, and really specifically my application, the sender's application is going to do, is it's going to encrypt that timestamp with the sender's private key, okay? The timestamp gets encrypted with the sender's private key. All right, now I send you that message. When that message comes into your email program, your email application sees this and says, hey, it looks like this message comes from Kelly. It has something that's encrypted with Kelly's private key. If it really was encrypted with Kelly's private key, I should be able to decrypt it with Kelly's public key, right? Remember the relationship between the two, anything encrypted by one can only be decrypted by the other, okay? So when I get this message, or when you get this message, your email program says, this looks like it comes from Kelly. Let's use Kelly's pro, uh, public key, Kelly's public key, to try to decrypt it. And if I can decrypt the timestamp, I know it was encrypted with Kelly's private, with only she has, which only she has. So just the fact that this timestamp can be decrypted proves that it came from Kelly. The timestamp was encrypted with Kelly's private, just so that when it gets to your system on your end, your application has an excuse to see if Kelly's public key will work. If Kelly's public key will work to decrypt the timestamp, then it had to have been encrypted with Kelly's private key. That is one that usually um, folks struggle with. And again, what it comes down to is really the fact that we're always trying to make encryption about privacy and not about, not necessarily about the other things like authenticity. So when we look at encryption for authenticity's sake, in that instance, what we're doing is we're using the sender's private key. And if you think about it, that makes sense. My private key is the only thing I have. I'm not sending you my private key, but I'm encrypting some basic information that's worthless to an attacker 
with my private. When your application gets it, your application says, oh, it looks like it comes from Kelly, but let's be sure. Let's decrypt this timestamp with Kelly's public key. And if that works, we know it was encrypted with her private, which only she has, so we know it came from Kelly. Okay, marinate on that for a second. Dramatic pause to drink coffee. I don't know if you can appreciate the Boston Terrier on the coffee mug, but good stuff. All right, so I always, I always do kind of say that one's tough because encrypting the timestamp, we're not encrypting the message, but we're encrypting the timestamp. It's really important that that timestamp be something that's worthless because if I encrypt it with my private key, and it can be decrypted with my public. Couldn't anyone decrypt? You know, couldn't anybody get my public key? Sure, but all they get is the ability to read the timestamp. All right, Lord, Lord Cecil, I like your name. That's a very ambitious name for Thursday. Um, is that private key really secure in the timestamp? Is it possible? Okay, so that's a terrific question, and that's one that sometimes folks get uh, confused with. The key is never in the timestamp. The key is used to encrypt the timestamp. So the key resides with me, right? The key is just a mathematical, you know, just a, a set of characters that are used but the key is used to lock, so to speak, the timestamp. Anybody that has my public key can unlock that timestamp, but all they know is that, hey, it's 12.05, right? It's not anything meaningful or valid to them. So the way a lot of times it works, um, a lot of times the message is encrypted with the receiver's public key, and then the timestamp is tacked on at the bottom, encrypted with the sender's private key. So the message contents get encrypted with the uh, receiver's public key for privacy, just like we saw here. And then the timestamp is encrypted with sender's private. Oh, um, Clara, I, I see your note about having some technical problems. What you might just want to do is exit and come back in you know it, it's kind of one of those things when all else fails turn it off and turn it on again and i think maybe that'll get you back in unless you want to play around with some of the settings all right so we've got privacy we've got authenticity the next thing we want to get is we want to get um integrity remember privacy authenticity integrity non-repudiation now, integrity doesn't even necessarily belong here because integrity, we don't get it through asymmetric cryptography. We don't get it through symmetric cryptography either. We don't use a key when we're looking for integrity through hashes. There's no key. So the secret of the hash or the magic of the hash is the fact that it uses one-way math. There are some math functions that are very easy to perform one direction and very hard to reverse. Just like it's very easy for me to drop a glass and it's very hard for me to put that glass back together. There's some types of math that are, you can just do quickly one direction and you can't reverse. I'll come back to that in just a second, but I want that phrase, one way math, okay? It doesn't use a key. All right, so here's where we are. We are trying to communicate. Uh, let's say Dave and I are communicating across a really unreliable link, okay? Um, there's a lot of interference, packets get dropped, we have problems. Dave and I aren't exchanging anything sensitive, so we don't care about privacy. I don't care about in, in, uh, authenticity. All I want is that when he gets the message, he knows that no packets were dropped, okay? That's all we're trying to do. Nothing about privacy or authenticity, just integrity. All right, so what Dave and I have decided to do ahead of time is for our message, we want integrity. So for our message, what we're going to do is we're going to take the numeric value for each letter of our message, and then we're going to add them all up for the total. So for instance, I'm sending Dave the message, hello. I want him to know it hasn't been modified in transit, didn't get corrupt. So H is the eighth letter, E is the fifth, L is the twelfth, L is the twelfth, O is the fifteenth, 
8 plus 5 is 13, 12 is 25, 37, 52. All right, so what we get is we get the number 52. Okay, this value is referred to as the message digest or the hash. Okay, the message digest or the hash. Claire, thank you for that question. And I think this was happening while your audio was kind of glitching out. I'm talking about it with asymmetric cryptography because a lot of times asymmetric cryptography will use hashing, but it's actually not symmetric or asymmetric. Hashing doesn't use a key. Hashing is just a math process that's easy to perform one way, it's hard to reverse. So it's actually neither, but what we're going to do in a minute is we're going to use hashing with um, asymmetric cryptography and, and bring it all together. So this is not symmetric or asymmetric, but we're headed that way. All right. Okay, so I send this message to Dave. It's got the hash number 52. Dave gets it. He does the same math I did, adds up. And when he does his math, he comes up with the number 52 also, then we can assume that there's been no modification. So he does his math, he comes up with the number 52. We're going to assume that means there's been no modification. Now, I got to tell you, this is a really weak hashing algorithm. This is Kelly's algorithm, right? We talked about Kelly in North Carolina math. So this is a very unsophisticated hashing algorithm. But it does kind of show you how hashes work. You know, the idea is, let's say this file gets corrupted in transit, and now um, it gets modified in transit. When Dave gets it on his end, he comes up with a different value than the hash value I had. So he says, ah, no, that doesn't work. Okay, so it's a way of detecting and determining if a message, if a file has been modified. Okay, and that's a hash. Now, again, I'm going to stress that the hash is one-way math, and that's really important, too. By the fact it's one-way math, what that means is you should not be able to look at a hash and reverse it to figure out what the message is. Okay, think about that, even with my hashing algorithm. You know what hashing algorithm I'm using, right? You know I'm taking the numeric value, I'm adding it up. Okay, let's say that the message itself is encrypted, but the hash for the message is in plain text. All right, and let's say that hash is, I mean, heck, I don't know. Let's say, okay, the message is encrypted, but down at the bottom, the hash is Okay, so you can't see the message, it's encrypted, but you can see the hash. Put it over here. So with this hash value, what is the message? Exactly, Dom, what you're saying. That would be nearly impossible. That's like me saying, what numbers did I add together to come up with the number 53,421? Could be any combination of characters. That's the one-way nature of math, uh, of hash functions, okay? So what that means is I don't have to have a key to create a hash, and I don't have to encrypt the hash, okay? So that's important as well. It doesn't take any additional overhead. And the hash should be meaningless to an attacker, meaning an attacker should not be able to look at that hash value and go, oh, your message is, dear Kelly, I went to, I uh, called your house yesterday and you weren't home, right? You shouldn't be able to figure that out. So what we're all leading to here is non-repudiation. Okay, but quick review. Privacy, receiver's public key. Authenticity, I take something worthless like a timestamp, and when I say worthless, meaningless to an attacker. A timestamp, encrypt it with the sender's private key. Okay. A hash produces a value, a fingerprint, if you will, of the message. The hash does not need to be encrypted. The sender will hash the document before sending. The receiver 
we'll hash it on their end. And if the two hash values are the same, then we get a reasonable assurance the message has not been modified. That's hashing. All right. Well, what I want now is I want non-repudiation. And non-repudiation is a combination of authenticity and integrity. Okay. So I want integrity. And the way I get integrity is through hashing. Okay. And then if I encrypt the hash with the sender's private key, that's what we mean when we say a digital signature. Okay, so remember, the hash guarantees the integrity of the message. The private key guarantees the authentication or the authenticity of the sender. When you use the two of them together, you get a digital signature, and that's what gives us non-repudiation. Marinate on that. I don't give you guys enough time to marinate for real, but you know this is sort of the stuff that you want to think about because this is really kind of behind the surface or underneath the surface of what's going on with our applications. Right. Again, this is in the application development piece where you would be including these algorithms or these mechanisms, but ultimately it's a good idea to, to know what's really going on. Okay. So asymmetric pain, privacy, authenticity, integrity, and non-repudiation. So for privacy, we use the receiver's public key. Authenticity, remember, something is encrypted with the sender's private key, something that's worthless to an attacker. For integrity, we create a hash, um, a checksum. Let me just modify. Let's say instead hash checksum message digest. Hey Kelly, you accidentally muted yourself a couple of sentences ago. I unmuted you. Oh. You now, how about now? Now you're good to go. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. We like to just test and see who's a, a good lip reader out there. I tell you what, that's a skill that's really helpful these days because so many glitches in the uh, in the communication. So now we can uh, learn to read lips. All right. So let me get back here. So what we said was privacy, authenticity, integrity, and then we know the non-repudiation piece. That particular piece is a digital signature. And with that case, the hash is encrypted by the sender's private key. And again, we call that a digital signature. So just to wrap things up, quick review. Give me just one quick second. Okay, so when we think about cryptography, we think about cryptographies falling in the category of either symmetric or asymmetric. Okay, now with, whoops, let me go back. Sorry about that. With symmetric cryptography, with symmetric algorithms, we have either stream ciphers or block ciphers. Okay, stream ciphers, if you'll remember, they are very, very fast, but they're unsecure. We kind of want to avoid stream ciphers based on today's standards, okay? The one stream cipher that I did mention was RC4, and we said that was relevant because that's what um, some of the wireless encryption mechanisms used at one point in time, although we've gotten away from that for the last 10 years or so. Um, the more uh, slow and steady wins the race, the block ciphers do take more time. They are slower. They require more processing overhead. 
but they provide greater security. So most of the algorithms that you'll actually see, you're gonna see being used are block ciphers, and the most common of which is AES. All right, now those are your symmetric algorithms. With your asymmetric algorithms, you don't have asymmetric streams or um, blocks. You have asymmetric math that either uses what's referred to as discrete logarithms and a finite field. That just is an entirely separate discussion. That can be a cliffhanger. Come back for one of our future sessions on discrete logarithms in a finite field. But basically it's discrete math or a term called factorization. Okay, we can get into that at another point in time, how these two pieces work. But the idea is, just like symmetric has two types of math to use, so does asymmetric. The types of math for asymmetric cryptography are discrete logarithms or factorization. All right, now we have several um, uh, asymmetric algorithms. Diffie-Hellman, ecc El Gamal, RSA is one that folks will see because it is used frequently for digital signatures, uh, like for secure websites and so on, so you may see that out in the future. Um, but again, there's a lot more of this that we could go into certainly at another time. So just again, symmetric, don't forget the pros and cons. We like it because it's fast. We got to figure out out of band key exchange. We got to be in an environment where it grows. We got to figure out how to get non repudiation. Asymmetric cryptography solves those problems, but it's slow. So, what we would wind up doing in the next session is we would be looking at a hybrid mechanism, which would be something like SSL or TLS, where we do asymmetric key exchange and then symmetric data exchange. All right. But alas, our time is kind of coming to an end. So I could talk about cryptography all day. If there's any interest, Brent, I would love to come back and do part two of crypto and we could just continue. Um, but what I'd like to do now, actually, is I'd like to um, uh, just hear from you guys, see if you have any questions on what we've talked about or if we can make this um, bioscience from UMBC. What prior knowledge would you need to get into crypto? So, you know, the, the thing is, I'm a big believer that people can do career changes. And I mean, totally change careers. You know, I, I was waiting tables when I decided to get into computers and I was working in the field within, you know, 12 to 16 months after shifting, I took some classes and, um, you know, this actually, believe it or not, was not what I grew up wanting to be. It's just, you know, I was an English major in college and I did a full and complete career change in the mid nineties. Um, so what do you need to know? Honestly, you just you need to have a willingness to learn. You need to have the ability to, um, you know, seek out, uh, sources that can help you develop your knowledge and increase your enhancement. But I would in no way say, oh, you have to have so many years in computer science and blah, blah, blah. I think if you have an interest in the material, yeah, you may want to go through an introductory, you know, networking class just to kind of see how all this plays in. But, um, you know, just start your, you're at a good school UMBC has a lot of wonderful classes. I would think you would be able to make that transition fairly easily. Uh, yeah, Dom, we have a lot of students uh, uh, in similar situations, such as yourself. I'm about to shoot my email address into the chat box. You can send me an email. We can set up like a time one-on-one -on -one to like talk about where your interests lie, um, what kind of experience you might already have, um, and we can get you set up on what would be a, a, an appropriate pathway to get into this kind of stuff. I think it's a great field and I love this field because this is one of those areas of expertise that you really can't outsource. You know, if you think about um, what is going to be around in the next 10 years, cybersecurity is not going anywhere, right? And clearly uh, a lot of what's, what's necessary is, you know, the configuration and the implementation, the understanding this can be done in a virtual environment telecommuting. I don't have to be there physically at the office. I think this is one of those ideas, and I've been in security exclusively for about the last 15 years. I've never once regretted that decision. If I did anything different, 
what I would have done, you know, talking to my younger self would be to specialize in like um, ethical hacking, forensic sciences, those sorts of things, because um, the capability of conducting uh, vulnerability assessments, pen tests, um, being able to research threats, uh, being able to go back and retrieve actions, forensic evidence collection. Those are big fields today. And they're ones that I think, you know, and this is just me. This would have been what I would have done. I would have specialized in that field. What else? What are some other questions I can answer for you all? Absolutely. Absolutely. Would crypto be of an advantage to a system admin? Everything you know in relation to security is going to be to your advantage, right? So, you know, by understanding the pros and cons, the limits, um, this would help you and your system determine, um, you know, what needs to be encrypted, which mechanism. So at the system administration level, you're still going to be able to make choices about what's encrypted and what isn't. And if you go a couple of layers down, you'll be able to choose which algorithms are used. You'll want to know which pros and cons. You want to know how the keys are exchanged. You know, I think about, for instance, IPsec. So within my organization, if I want to exchange information encrypted on my network, I may be using IPsec. Well, understanding all of those pieces and all those layers down can help me make sure I configure it. And it can also help me make sure that I can monitor it properly. And there are just so many other elements. But yes, absolutely. Um, understanding this as a system admin. And honestly, today you can't just be a system admin. You know, I, I got started, like I said, years and years ago as a hardware technician. You can't just be a hardware technician today. You have to be a hardware technician that knows networking, that understands security and software today, right? Because everything's so integrated. So to be a security admin without having an understanding of cryptography and other areas of security would really put you at a disadvantage. So I would absolutely say this is essential. Don't be shy. How many of you are going to be kept up at night tonight wondering, but how do we get asymmetric key exchange and symmetric data exchange? Dom, another good question. You guys have such great questions. Would I suggest starting with search prior to diving into this, like A plus and network plus? I do. Now, I have to tell you in this, this from my perspective, net plus is a better class to start with. Um, you know, and I'll let Brent, Brent has a lot of information and can see things from a lot more of a business perspective. This is just my opinion, but I think every person on the planet should have network plus because networks aren't going away. Every person on the planet needs to understand IP addressing. You need to understand essential security. You need to understand protocols and the principles of communicating. So, oh, Omar, we must talk. CISSP is my, is my specialty. I'd love to talk with you a little bit offline. So at any rate, I think it's good to lay a foundation. You know, and, and as, as difficult a time as this is, guys, this is a tremendous time to take advantage of having to stay put, to take advantage maybe of having more time than we really want off. Because, you know, for me, I have two certifications that I've been meaning to get, meaning to get. And I'm now studying for them. Um, and I got nothing else to do. So, and actually I have a ton else to do, but I'm just trying to take advantage of this time. I would, I would recommend Network Plus. I would also recommend Security Plus before you specialize. Those should give you a good foundation that you can spring into a specialty. You could go CISSP. You know, if you're thinking of going into management down the line, CISSP, there's also um, a CISM for uh, information security management. There are project management, all those would be good. Uh, if you want to go technical, that's when you can think about doing your ethical hacking 
classes. If you want to go more towards forensics, that would lead into their several hacking and forensics classes. The nice thing about this field is there's room for everybody, regardless of your personality, regardless of your interests. There's a niche for you. Um, and I think it's a great field. I have never once, like I said, I was an English major. I would have never dreamt this would be my career field. I have never, ever regretted it. It is, um, it's a tremendous field. It's growing. It's not going away. It's not getting outsourced. Yeah, just, just to echo that, you know, what, what we've seen, you know, a lot of people have that misconception that you need to have a degree in computer science or, or experience in a technical field, but kind of the common thread or characteristic that we've seen with our students that have been able to be successful is that genuine curiosity and willingness to try things and learn and break stuff and find out how you broke it and then learn from that so that you don't break it again. So, uh, Kelly is spot on with, you know, you really can come from any kind of background. It, as long as you've got an interest in this, it, it's something that'll be a prevailing trait. And I think I 100% agree with that. It, it's more about your interest. Is it something you love doing? Because I've also seen people shift over because they hear, oh, you can make money or this, that, or the other in this field but it's not their personality type. And that makes it very difficult. I always used to laugh because I would teach class labs and you know, not every lab works a hundred percent correctly every time. And you know, and, and this has been years ago, but I remember I had a group of students and this one woman was a career changer and she got so frustrated at this lab and she was just so just, ugh, you know, sign. I was like, honey, what do you think this job is going to be? You have to like this stuff. If you're going to do well, if you're going to thrive, it has to be an interest, right? Uh, will you get hired if you have the certifications and no experience? That's a great question as well. And I think the greatest disservice that we can do is say, hey, you get certified, you'll have a $60,000, $80,000, $100,000 job waiting for you. No. You know what? What you need to do is while you're getting certified, you need to get some experience. You can get experience while you're working on your certification. You can volunteer. That's how I started. Like I said, I was waiting tables when I decided, oh, I think I'll do computers. So what did I do? I went out and I volunteered at the local women's shelter. And I went out there two nights a week and I worked on their network. I helped them install software. I, um, I conducted some training classes and no, it wasn't paid. And yet that was something on my resume that I could say, other than just me being good with computers at home, I've done. You know what, take a lousy paying job for 10 hours a week, 15 hours a week, working at you know company A or company B that does some computer stuff. You've got to work to build your resume. 20 years ago, you could just have the cert and walk in and get a job. I mean, that literally is how it was. I saw it happen all the time. What you want is when you're really valuable, you've got some experience and the cert. And I, I would be lying if I said, you know, that that comes immediately. You've got to put in a little bit of time. The other thing I found is that once that companies need, want to see the certification, that that's one of the main credentials that they use for hiring and firing. If you don't have any experience, go into the resume, uh, go into the interview and just be totally honest, because that's how I got an early on job of mine as well. Um, I went in, I worked for Icon Office Solutions, and I said, you know what? I'm brand new to this field. It's been a hobby of mine. I love it. I want to learn. And then I said the magic words, I will work for dirt cheap. I just want to, I just want to help and I want to learn. And I got my job really as being an intern making almost no money. But again, if you can afford to do that, or if you can pick up something in the evenings, a couple of days a week, just to get experience on the resume. By the time you get your cert, you got a cert and a resume with some experience. That's what's going to get you in the door. Your first job is not going to be your dream job. The best way I found to give myself a raise actually was to switch companies, you know, and I've, I've done that a few times, but like I said, I'm just being as honest with you. The reason I love training um, and I've been training for years, but I absolutely love it. It's because I feel like 
this field is so open for so many people that if I can help somebody get into it, I would love to, because it absolutely changed my life. It's being able to do what you love and, and that's such a gift. So, um, so yeah. How can we leverage an understanding of crypto into a successful job interview in the field? So, you know, I don't necessarily recommend busting out your knowledge of skipjack in your interview. However, what frequently happens is that you have technical interviews, right? You know, you, you pass through the HR uh, reference check that piece, and then you meet with the department head or you meet with, um, with a technical expert that's going to ask you some questions to see what you know. And it will assuredly, assuredly, the revolving around security, at least a portion of those questions. So understanding the principles of cryptography um, are going to be critical in a technical interview. If I'm running a department that has computers, I am not hiring any person in my computer department that doesn't have an understanding of security. And in a lot of cases, especially in this area, when you're dealing with government and military, they are not even allowed to bring certain people into certain roles unless you have certain um, certifications. If you're in this area, uh, or if you anticipate working with the government, working with um, military, you're going to have to have some of the basic certifications. Um, again, the basic ones, Net Plus, Security Plus. Then if you want to become more technical, CISSP is one that's very popular. Um, but you're just gonna, you're, you're gonna have to get some certs if you wanna get in the field, in my opinion, you know? And again, everybody's got a different line of thought. I certainly don't wanna present as this being the only way, but this has just been what I've seen. Can I answer anything else for you? A silence falls across the crowd. <laughs> all right. Well, folks, I really do. Oh, I'm glad, Mamie. Thank you all. Um, Omar, I'm going to, uh, and actually, just provide you all with my email address. If any of you have any follow-up questions or think of a question here or, or you know, if, if there's anything that I can help you with, like I said, I'd be happy to do so. Feel free to reach out, shoot me an email. And Omar, I'd love to have a little email chat with you on CISSP because like I said, that's my specialty and I've got um, some recommendations for how to be most successful with it. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for the very informative and engaging presentation, Kelly. Um, everybody that attended and even those that may be registered but were unable to come today will get like a follow-up email um, with, all, with, with our information in it. So please feel free to reach out if we can be of assistance in any way. And we look forward to uh, working with, with some of you in the future. Absolutely. I hope you have a great afternoon. Stay safe, everybody. And uh, I hope to see you in a training class somewhere along the way. Yes, Take care. absolutely. All right. Be safe, everyone. Bye-bye.